Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have the always adorable Jane Wild here. Thank you. How are you? I'm amazing. How are you today, I'm Holly? I'm great. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm excited to be here. I mean, when you um, brought it up and said, oh, we got to get you on the podcast, I was like, I love doing podcasts and I just think you're personally so cool. So I just knew it was going to be like a good time. I love that because sometimes like I get a lot of people requesting different girls for podcasts Mm -hmm. and some of them like either don't want to do it Mm -hmm. or just don't like get back to me and like completely ignore me and I'm just like, okay. I mean, some people aren't really meant for podcasts. Some people don't like to do interviews and they don't want to talk, which I get too, but it's always like I, I find this strange in this strange area where I'm like, did she get my message or is she just ignoring me? I mean, it's me? like, what, what do I do? Do I continue? Cause I don't want to be that like annoying person. Yeah. No, it's blatantly rude on their part, but like they don't owe you a response, but right. they don't deserve to be on your podcast. Like, yeah, that's, that's right. How, yeah. You don't deserve it. Like, fuck that. Well, can I curse? Yes. Okay, just making oh sure. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Girl, curse all you want. Okay, cool. Um, so the one thing that we should probably put that away is because the logo. Er, the logo. Yeah. Everyone knows what it is. I know. Even though like we have Sony on the side here. Yeah. It's it redundant. But okay. Whatever. Yeah. Um, old habits die hard. We're so used to hiding logos yeah, and porn tape scenes. and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember the fir- I remember the first time I saw you. Um, I was casting for Playboy oh, and yeah. Bailey sent me your pictures yeah. and I thought you were super cute. But at the time they like didn't want girls with any tattoos. I get they it. They were super strict. You have like one little heart. Yeah, tattoo I have right my here. heart. It's kind of like what I'm known for, I guess, by some people. But I don't like it. No? Unfortunately, yeah. I re- like I wish I did. I really would love it because then I wouldn't have to go through this whole tattoo removal process. Is that what you're gonna do? I'm in the process right now. That it's- shouldn't be hard to take out though. It's like That's- it's just black, it's a thin line. Like I see some girls with gnarly Crazy tattoos ones, right? that get taken out. It's it's definitely taking longer than I thought it would. I'm gonna probably explore different options than what I'm currently doing because mm-hmm. it's just taking too long. And- yeah. I just want to, like, you know, not have it anymore. I'm, yeah. I'm at this weird in-between phase. But right. I, like, I definitely wish if I did have a tattoo that it was something I actually liked and put thought into. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, this was just a spur-of-the-moment decision when I was 17 yeah. from peer pressure. Yeah. And I don't know, like, I genuinely, I feel like I'm somewhat intelligent. And I look back and I'm just like, what the fuck was I thinking? Like that (laughs) placement, that artist, like I wasn't 18 and we signed the consent form saying that we were Mm -hmm. and he didn't ask for ID or anything. So I was like, that's shady in itself. Like it was a mistake. It's funny because I wanted to be kind of rebellious too when I was younger, but I didn't want to get, first of all, my parents told me if I got a tattoo, they would disown me. (laughs) Um, and I didn't want to like pierce my nose or anything cause I was afraid of getting scars. So I pierced my tongue cause I was oh like, my well, God. nobody can see. That's like really. a step up from your nose. Yeah. So I did have a pierced tongue for many years, but then it, crazy. it fell out one day and then I was like, yeah, it's probably, oh my God. it's it, probably, yeah, what it's was that, for the best. What was that pain like? <clears throat> I was really high. Okay. Like good. really, really, really high at the time. Yeah. So, um, I don't think it was. It actually wasn't as bad as you would think it would be. What it was. I just it was can't real imagine because it's like so. Like when you bite your tongue, it's yeah. agony. Yeah. I had yeah. my nipples pierced um, for a couple of years when I first got in the industry. Mm-hmm. I ha- got them when I was 15. That's so bad. Oh my but god. But there's this place. I'm from New York, like mm-hmm. New York City. And there's this place in New York called St. Mark's. Mm-hmm. It's like a a block, a street um, near like NYU. Mm-hmm. And it's downtown, and it's just, like, a lot of, like, piercing tattoo shops, like, Dollar Pizza, a lot of, like, trendy stores. And there was this one place that would just give us all the piercings and never ask for ID or anything. And (sighs) you are pretty young-looking anyway, so at 15, you must have definitely looked at least your age, if not younger. I definitely, I mean... At this point in time, I don't even know what it means to, like, look 15 because there's 15-year-olds that <laughs> no, look 15. that's so true. So I think I looked young as fuck. But it's maybe so true. People, These days, like, 15-year-old girls look like they're 25 to me. Like, like, I cannot tell. Like, I see um, girls in the industry, 
will post pictures sometimes. They'll be like, oh, throwback to like 10 years ago when I was like 16. And for, I don't think that's right. I don't agree with like posting underage pictures on mm-hmm. a porn Twitter. Mm-hmm. But it's just so funny. Sometimes like they really don't look different. And yeah. Like I don't know if you just didn't age or if you aged prematurely. Like, but you just don't <laughs> look different. You look the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a blessing, I think. So it's just funny because, you know, when I first saw you, it was like shooting, you know, maybe shooting you for Playboy. And when I would shoot for Playboy, a lot of the girls um, were girls who were kind of a little bit nervous about being nude. So there was usually like I had to be really specific with my questions about what they were comfortable showing and how Mm -hmm. naked they were comfortable being. I mean, I had one girl show up who didn't actually think she was getting naked at all. What do you think play? I don't get it. What do you think Playboy is? That's what I kind of said. It's confusing. And we flew her in from San Francisco and everything. There was no like discussion. She wasn't like, what does this entail? Well, she, so that was back when they had a casting department that Sam Remo was running Mm -hmm. and he booked her. So I guess I assumed that he talked to her about it and I guess I guess he assumed that she knew that Playboy was nude but for some reason no this is during the period too it was at remember how Playboy went non-nude yeah and then they went back to nude like a year later the news about them going non-nude was like spread like wildfire because like what's the point of Playboy being non-nude it's Playboy but them going back to nude was not such a big news story so a lot of people actually didn't know that they went back to nude oh I see but here's the thing too I was shooting for Playboy Plus the website not the magazine Mm -hmm. Playboy Plus never stopped being nude like nothing ever changed there and I feel like a lot of girls they get confused and they think like oh they're doing a one shoot for Playboy Plus and they think like oh I'm gonna be like a playmate like I'm gonna there is a lot of magazine yeah there's a lot of confusion which is understandable you know people don't know like the inner yeah. workings of playboy but no. um so i just remember like seeing you were super cute and thinking of you in a way where you know i was gonna have to like kind of tiptoe around like whether or not you were okay showing your vagina oh my god <laughs> and, and now you're like you know and yeah. you're like the queen of anal porn now so it's like you've come so far my Thank dear you. yeah i mean I definitely, like, never thought that I would be where I am right now, but I couldn't imagine life to be different at this point. And you're so, like, tiny. Yeah. And, okay, so there are some (laughs) recent photos that were posted on uh, Twister. (laughs) Woo! On Twitter um, of an IR scene that you did with, who is, what's the dick? And it's, like, so big. Dread. Is it Dread? Okay. Oh, that one where my asshole is just, like, huge. Not even that one. Before I saw that one, I saw the one of you holding his dick like it was a sandwich. Oh and yeah, and like biting. Like, yeah, the and corn. it just looks like it's like a like a yeah. massive subway that you'll never be able to eat. Yeah, and I remember seeing that picture, going, "How the fuck is that going to go inside of her?" It was crazy. I mean, when Jules first approached me about doing that shoot, I had just started doing anal a couple of months before, but I was like, I was really into it. Mm. I was like, I was realizing, you know, that I could do it and not just do it like normal, but really take it and gape. Mm -hmm. Gaping is like, I didn't know that gaping was such a popular niche. Like I didn't realize I Mm. just didn't, but he asked me to do it. And I said, you know, can we do anal? And he said, whatever you're comfortable with. And I I said, okay, then I'm going to try it. And his dick is huge. It's the biggest dick I've ever, ever seen in my life except for maybe one other person but I don't even want to talk about him okay because he sucks but Dredd is an amazing performer and what was I saying his dick it was, was the really biggest big. but like next to my tiny hands and mm-hmm. face it just looked like astronomical so are you one of those people that do you find sometimes anals easier than vaginal yeah. Okay, Absolutely. yeah. I know quite a few girls like that. Absolutely. I mean, Because your vagina is really tight, right? It's, it's so tight. And I actually just tweeted about this the other day that it's actually kind of frustrating and it really bums me out sometimes, like, how tight it is. And I know people, a lot of people commented on that and said, like, either oh, I want to fuck that tight pussy. Mm -hmm. Or they said, like, you should be happy you have a tight pussy. And I'm just like, maybe if I was, like, a regular civilian girl that just wanted, like, 
quick validation from people telling me like, oh my God, your Mm -hmm. pussy's so tight. But like when it's actually a career and a job and I have to get fucked hard in the pussy probably like four times a week at least, it definitely takes a toll on my body and my, yeah, it kind of hurts. Like what I'm realizing is that like when people don't use enough lube, it creates like this friction and it's like tearing away at the skin Like, but like it's fine like I always recover I just need to like have that recovery time it always bounces back but it's just like you know do you book your boy girl seats then with like time in between them yes um Spiegler when I first went with Spiegler he asked like you know how many boy girls can you do in a row how many anals can you do and I told him like you know I can do like two sometimes three boy girls in a row depending on the guy on the guy his dick size what type of scene it is but I would much prefer to have, like, you know, a boy girl than a girl girl than a boy girl than mm-hmm. an anal. And just, like, I like the fact that the scenes I do are versatile because it's not just, like, constant strain mm-hmm. on my pussy. That's yeah. It. So, I mean, do you f- – so what do you do then? Do you just, like, have to warm it up before a scene? Do you ever use toys or you just have, like, the guy start um, off real slow? I just really, like, they just – use a lot of lube and start slow, it, it stretches out. Like mm-hmm. eventually it, and when I get aroused, like it opens more. That's mm-hmm. just like female anatomy. But, um, oh my God, I lost my train of thought. This happens all the time. Um, <laughs> about getting your pussy to open up. Yeah. About getting it to open up. It just opens, but yeah, they definitely have to take it slow at first. And sometimes like, I find it funny when people say like, it's the myth that the more a girl gets fucked, like her pussy is loose. Mm -hmm. I just think it's so funny because it's actually the exact opposite. The more you have sex in the pussy, it gets swollen and it shuts Mm. and it's like clamped shut. So that kind of happens to me sometimes. It's hard to do a boy girl. If it was like a really tough scene the day before and then to do another one, it just takes longer. Yeah. I can imagine. You know, it was interesting. There was this one girl that I worked with who, she brings a vibrator and she uses it on her clit before mm-hmm. the boy girl scene. Like yeah. even just for a couple of minutes to like get her aroused. And yeah. she said it helps her open up so much. And yeah. I was like, that makes so much sense to me. Yeah. But I'd never seen anybody else do that. I used to do that for anal. Mm-hmm. Like when I first started, it was, um, it was a way to associate like the quote unquote pain of anal mm-hmm. with like sexual pleasure. Mm-hmm. I never really had like serious pain, more just like, uncomfortable stretching yeah. yeah but um using the vibrator definitely helps but I don't even use that anymore because I've kind of like learned about my asshole's like elastic what elasticity is the word? elasticity yeah mm-hmm. I've learned about it and I know how it works now and um after doing that scene with dread I kind of I just like no you know I just have an instinct now for like how it's going to be that day. And it's just like a comfort, a a thought in my head, knowing like no matter how scared I am of this dick, like I will take it and it won't hurt. Because if I can do anal with dread without pain, then I can do anal with anyone. So it's kind of like a confidence booster. It was. And that was back in September. So I've definitely within the last like eight or nine months, I've gotten so much better at anal and I do DP now and... It's amazing. I just love this journey of like discovering things about my body. It's so crazy because I never would have known that I can do this type of like sexual acrobatic things. Yeah, it's definitely sexual acrobatics for sure. I mean, I'm always so impressed by (laughs) you guys when I'm filming these things. I'm like, I don't know how you do that. Yeah. I'm such a pussy when it comes to sex. I'm just always like, my knees, my thighs, (laughs) I don't want to do this. Like, I'd be the whiniest porn star. Well, sometimes I'm like, like, if I'm just not in the mood, and it kind of sucks sometimes when, like, you're not in the mood and you still have to go to work. I was just thinking about this the other day, and I was Mm -hmm. thinking, like you know when a guy is like soft and then he you know like we're on set we're about to start you have to get hard they have to go to that place in their mind mm-hmm. and really just like start to get off no matter what's happening if people are talking and laughing in the background or yeah. they're staring and I just thought about it and it's like what if the girls everyone was like staring at you and you had to wait while your pussy got like 
wet, wet yeah. from like arousal. Like yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't happen. Right. We, we wouldn't have porn. Right. I know. So I'm just like, um, it's really commendable to the guys that actually are able to do that and not just do it, but do it well. I really admire them. I, you know, I say all the time that like, we don't give the guys enough credit because they not are at all. such a integral part of the scene. And a lot of times they're the ones who carry it. And like good male talent is so hard. It's to so find. hard to come by. Yeah. I find that my biggest struggle when I'm shooting stuff for like naughty America is, is finding good guys, you know, especially if yeah. I don't have a lot of time to book my scene because all the good talents always They're booked, booked up. Booked out. And I'm always like, fuck. And so I'm like, I got to try like new guys out, which yeah. I hate doing. I hate, like, I don't like working with new guys. I don't mind working with new girls as long as they, you know, I don't feel like, I don't want to sound fucked up when I say this, but like at my first scene with a girl I had never really, like, fucked a girl before or Mm -hmm. done anything, and it kind of just came naturally. Like, whether or not you're attracted to girls, I think there's not really an excuse to show up on set and have, like, zero idea what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, for guys and girls, but, like, for girl-girl scenes, I feel. But, yeah, I don't like working with new guys because it's, like— you know, they can either do it or they can't. And there's mm-hmm. a 50% chance that they can't. I feel like there's like a 90% <laughs> chance that they can't. And there's at least a 50% chance. Yeah. Like it's at least half and half. They're yeah. either going to fail or they're not. Yeah. And I just feel like why should we have to like sacrifice our whole day and our time and our money for some guy that like probably just wanted to get his dick wet and yeah. couldn't even do it? Yeah. Like. Yeah, that's just how it is. It sounds harsh, but sometimes you have to be harsh because a lot of these guys are out here like trying to make it as a male talent. And I'm just like, just do Sometimes, you know, you just got to throw in the towel. Do your own thing. Like kudos to you if you can stay hard in your own bedroom, fucking your girlfriend on an iPhone. (laughs) Do that. You can make money, substantial money from doing that. But don't waste like a professional production company's time Mm -hmm. just because you wanted to fuck like your favorite porn star. Like, I just hate so many guys ask me in my DMs and stuff like, how can I become an adult film star? And I'm like, if you really care and wanted to do it you would just google it like i did and yeah. everyone else did and find a way because it's not that difficult yeah just find an agency and they'll throw and you into like a blow bang or yeah. something like that you'll and start see get, how if, you do. if you have the look you'll start getting booked yeah that rhymed oh, yeah <laughs> like that. that into a t-shirt yeah <laughs> so how did you get into the industry then okay so um the porn industry i basically um I guess I'll just start from the beginning because I may as well. I've never really talked about this publicly before, um, so I'm a little nervous, but I feel like I want to, you know, tell people because it's my truth. It's part of my story and why I am who I am. Um, But when I was 18, so probably like two weeks after I turned 18, I was working at American Apparel Mm -hmm. and I hated that job and I didn't want that job. But I also wasn't going to college. I already knew at that point because um, the way I I'm just not a college girl. Like I'm just not it's not for me. Sometimes you just know. And you know what? (laughs) There's a lot of people who are going to college, getting themselves into serious student loan debt and and then then coming out of college and not getting the jobs they wanted. Having nothing. Or finding that they didn't need to go to college to even pursue the career they end up pursuing. So the idea of going to college is becoming like less and less of an of a thing now, you know. So I, mean, I don't think you should feel ashamed of that. I'm at all. not. I'm definitely not ashamed, especially considering my current circumstances. Yeah. It's worked out well. Yeah. But um so I didn't want to work there anymore. So I started looking on Craigslist for different types of jobs um that I might want to do. And I found one job that it was like webcamming, mm-hmm. like sign up to be a webcam model. You can make like a thousand dollars a week or something like that. And I mm-hmm. said, that sounds pretty fucking good. So I messaged the guy who posted the ad and he said, oh, I'll pick you up and we can talk about it. So he picked me up and, uh, you know, he had a really nice car. He had like a Gucci wallet and all these nice things about him. So I thought, you know, this guy, like he has He's money. money yeah. So clearly this stuff works. And he took me to a hotel and, uh, 
he had a computer and he was showing me my free cams, mm -hmm. which is the website that I started camming on. And he, I had a shift later that day at like five o'clock mm -hmm. and he was telling me like, you can make so much money doing this. Like you can become huge. Like webcamming is the new porn. Like nobody's doing porn anymore. Like everybody watches cam girls mm -hmm. and I knew nothing about it. I had never heard of camming. I never heard of my free cams because, you know, I was underage a couple mm -hmm. weeks before, mm -hmm. but I thought it sounded amazing. And I said, you know, I'm personable. I can definitely do this. So I need to make a decision right now whether I'm going to leave this guy and go to work and just forget this whole thing or I'm going to call out or quit my job and start camming and just see where it takes me. Because at that point I like, had – start right then? Not at that exact moment, but, okay. like, that would be the beginning like of, like, my journey. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I – I had nothing going for me at the time. Like, I knew I wasn't going to school. I felt lost. Um, my mental health was not the best. Um, so I said, you know, fuck it. I called my work and I said I'm not coming in. I quit. I didn't even give two weeks, which was a dick move, but whatever. Um, and then I started camming. So this guy, he basically, what he just, like, showed me to be camming was that I would do he apparently owned like a studio like a cam studio okay. and a lot of other girls like cammed under him right um and he would provide like the resources like a place to work and you know stuff that you needed and blah 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 and mentorship and all this stuff and he apparently worked in the adult industry for a long time and you know all this stuff and I was naive mm -hmm. clearly um and I think like I was almost in denial of like what the situation really was and I just wanted it so bad to be mm -hmm. like you know my way of not having to work at this shitty job and my way of being successful at something and, and independent yeah and independent and, and yeah. being happy because I already like felt pressure to move out like you know my parents they said like you don't have to move out yet you're fine but you know, you, you feel like a burden Like yeah. at 18 is usually when people go to school and then they're yeah. not living at home. So I definitely felt like uncomfortable at home. But so I started camming and slowly over the next couple of months with that guy's mentor mentorship, I say it very loosely, mm. I started to realize that the situation was not what I thought it was at all. Um, this studio that he had was not really, like, I don't think it was anything. To this day, I don't really know, like, what it was. But to make a long story short, he wasn't really, like, who he said he was, I don't mm -hmm. think. He lied about a lot of things, like his name. And I told, like, he knew everything about me. He knew, because he, he didn't have my bank info. But my payments, like, my earnings from my free cams would go to his studio account and then he would take the money out and give it to me mm -hmm. but I didn't like I didn't have direct connection to my money mm -hmm. and over time like he stopped mentioning like the studio and all these other things like he was just talking about his own projects and not really talking about my camming anymore but we still talked and you know and he was taking a percentage of your money I, he says no but I do not know I feel like the answer is yes yeah um, and, you know, over time, the relationship became less and less professional, like mm -hmm. a mentorship and very personal and mm -hmm. more like a romantic relationship that I never really consented to or wanted to be in. But mm -hmm. he had kind of like made me feel like, you know, I couldn't succeed in this industry without his help. And mm -hmm. at this point I was way too deep in and I couldn't just leave adult and just go back to my regular life because I didn't have a regular life. Right. It's like this was the the very beginning of my adult life. Right. So I felt like very desperate and he didn't threaten me, but he just very heavily implied that I didn't really have any other options. Wow. Um, and then in September – that summer he started getting really distant and just not talking to me anymore and he would pay me less and less frequently. Like I had to reach out a lot of times just to get paid. And 
I was getting so tired of it. My anxiety was just like at an all time high. And I was like, you know, I don't deserve to feel this way. And then in September of 2017, I lost my grandma to a suicide. Oh, God. Yeah. It, it was a lot in that moment to deal with like that guy yeah. being on my mind and then this. Um, and then at the end of that month, um, he hadn't been paying me. So I contacted my free cams and said, look, I need my own account because this guy's not giving me my money. And mm -hmm. every time I cam, I'm, I can't get the money. So they said, okay, we, we made you your own independent account. And then at the end of that month, he called me and was saying, you know, like you shouldn't have messed with my money. Like they closed the account. And I said, look, I didn't ask them to close your account. I just asked for mine because you said a lot of things that ended up not being true. And, you know, he made some... And he wasn't paying you. No, he wasn't giving me the money at that point. Like, right. he wasn't... I wasn't seeing him, so I was camming less and less, and I felt like a degenerate. Yeah. And, like, I'm I'm n almost 19. I don't want to live in my parents' house anymore doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, you know, he gave some implied threats, but he didn't actually threaten outright threaten me but he said like oh this constitutes as beef like we have problems now like send me the the emails that you had with them back and forth and I just hung up and I wow. blocked his number and I never spoke to him again I never heard from him again but for a while I had really bad anxiety that he would just show up at my house and it took me a long time you to probably like, felt really like manipulated and betrayed too I can't even describe how manipulated I felt and then not until like March of 2018 did I start identifying what happened as like trafficking because mm. I realized like that is what it is I was a naive 18 year old girl barely 18 I had no idea how the sex industry worked or webcamming I didn't even know what that was and I was coerced into doing something that I didn't really know anything about based on false pretenses mm -hmm. And when it involves sex work, that's trafficking. Right. So it's taken me a really long time to like, you know, come to terms with that and be okay with how that is the beginning of my journey, but mm -hmm. it's not what defines me. Um, and how far I've gotten in the porn industry is only on my own. Right. Nobody has helped me besides like my agents, obviously, but nobody, no outside figure has like helped me or promoted me to get where I am in porn. And that is something that like really that I love mm -hmm. and that makes me feel so good about myself because it is like a really low blow to find out that you wasted so much time doing something with someone that didn't have your best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. it, it sucks. I'm not going to lie, but it's definitely made me like a stronger, smarter person. Yeah. Yeah. That's my story. That's wow. I'm really sorry about that. It's, um, thank you. I appreciate that, but it's not like, I don't look at it anymore as a bad thing because I wouldn't have started doing porn. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's taken me a while to like grapple with that. Like, how can I be okay with these terrible things that have happened? Um, if it, indirectly or directly led to my happiness now but you just have to like you know be okay with what your story is and what your journey is and just keep going so it's really interesting because you know there's a lot of controversy right now about um like you know people labeling porn as sex trafficking yeah and and there's you know the difference between sex trafficking and you know legitimate sex work mm -hmm. and it sounds to me well, you have experienced kind of like both, both. sides. So yeah. what would you say, like, how would you define the difference between the two if you were talking to like some politician or yeah. somebody who was like, oh, all girls in porn are sex trafficked? Um, I honestly, like to be so real with you, I have no idea. All I know is how I feel about both experiences and mm -hmm. what I went through, what I currently experience versus what I did go through in that experience and they're just nothing alike yeah and I think anyone with a common sense can kind of figure out what trafficking is versus 
not sex trafficking. I mean, the people who claim that they're one in the same, I think they just want that to be true because mm-hmm. it fits their agenda. Right. And they don't want to listen to people who've had positive experiences because it doesn't it's foreign to them and it doesn't fit in with their beliefs. Yeah, what they and what they want to imagine porn is like. Yeah. Well, I would say like just from hearing your story, like the most glaring differences are in the current career you have, you have complete control over your money. Yeah. You're paid directly yes. from the, I mean, I know when I pay you, I give you a check made yeah. out to you. I get a check. None of my checks go to my agent. Right. Although my, I don't know about other agents, but my agent would never pull any weird, funny shit like that. He's yeah. like one of the most honest people yes. in the industry. But, um, they, you know, companies do give me the option of having the check sent to him, but I always just have it sent to me because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a, I'm a grown woman. I can control my own money. Mm-hmm. And that was a red flag that I did not identify. And I still sometimes I don't think about it too much because you can't live in regret, but mm-hmm. I do sometimes regret not thinking about that earlier and finding issues with it because I was just like, I'm getting paid. I have money to buy weed and I wasn't paying rent. I still lived at Mm -hmm. home. So I was like, you know, who fucking cares? Like if he gives me the cash, like I don't care. Yeah. I wish I did care though. No, I know. I mean, and look, we've all been through experiences like that. Like I've had, you know, I had some people who ran my website for a while and um, the money from my members did not go to me. They went into their bank account and then they they would pay me out of their bank account, which isn't like highly unusual. Like companies like Fan Centro do that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But they have a very, very um, transparent like um, way of showing you the money that you've made, the percentage that they take. You, You get report every yeah. single week. I mean, you, you're on Fan Central, right? Like, I'm not. You're not. Currently, no. Don't you have a Snapchat? No. Oh. I, I don't like Snapchat. Ah, it's not my favorite. Wow. <laughs> you're like one of the few girls I know. Yeah. I so. fuck with OnlyFans. Okay. So same with OnlyFans because yeah. the money goes into their account and then they pay you out. So, yeah. But there's a very like transparent way of showing yeah. you the records and all that kind of stuff and you have access to all that information. The people that I worked with didn't have that. They like oh. at the very beginning, they didn't have reporting really at all i just had to like believe what they told me and then they had some like bullshit reporting which was clearly like not something that was automatically calculated they were just kind of throwing numbers in there and there was no way for me to verify it so and and i couldn't really know if they were I, I still to this day have no idea if they were giving me all my money or not it's so crazy because like the way that and that's how I figured out that this guy was like a textbook predator, like Mm -hmm. textbook, because Mm -hmm. so many, I read so many articles. I was on Google for hours and hours after that, just researching like manipulation tactics and sociopaths and things that um, grown men do to younger girls to manipulate them into doing things. And one of the things was, you know, making me feel like safe and comfortable. And there was total transparency on my end because of that and zero transparency on his. So that left me in a very vulnerable position because, you know, when somebody knows everything about you, they can ruin your life in a second. Yeah. And also making you feel like you didn't have any other options. Yeah. That's another textbook. And that's, yeah. Um, to keep me in it definitely with sex trafficking specifically, um, they they use the stigma against sex work to try and like trap you in this bubble mm. and make you think like well you already got naked online so you'll never get a real job like nobody will want to hire you this will haunt you for life so you mm-hmm. just need to keep going and make right. a career out of it right and I felt that way now I obviously know that that's not true you're not bordered into anything you can do anything you want in your Mm -hmm. life and sex workers can be be doctors and lawyers yes it will be more difficult there will be more trials and tribulations but you can do anything Mm -hmm. and at the time I felt like I can't do anything especially when you don't really have um the knowledge at your disposal and you have only one person feeding you information about an entire industry and I could have um I know, like, I could have looked it up, I guess, but I 
kind of like I was living in denial. It's almost like, like you don't want to know. I didn't want yeah. to know. And that's because once you have the information, then you have to do something. About yeah. It. Like you need I, to face what you're dealing with. I look back now and it's like, I didn't tell any of my friends what was going on. I didn't tell my parents. I mean, they knew that he was in my life, but they didn't know how I was feeling and the negativity mm-hmm. that was starting to come out about it. And I realized that I was hiding it because I, deep down in my subconscious, I knew that he was bad news and nothing good was going to come. And I thought I was fucked. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let me just not say anything and maybe it'll get better. And it didn't get better. But um, after that situation, that really, and then the loss of my grandma, I had to really like step back and just be like, what do I want to do with my life? Like, what do I want to make of myself? Mm -hmm. I need to decide because I can't keep living this way. And that's when I decided, you know, I want to do content. I want to be on camera doing stuff, but I don't want to shoot it myself because then it's going to be really low quality Mm -hmm. and I don't want to put out low quality content. So I came to the conclusion that, you know, mainstream porn was what I wanted to do next. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started that journey. And I don't regret anything. Like, I can't. Yeah. Because I'm so happy with where I ended up that it's just part of my story. Yeah. Who did you shoot with first when you first did mainstream porn? So my first shoot was in Florida. I remember it was January 2nd, 2018. Wow. Yeah, I remember the day because I just, like, it's so clear to me. It's so vivid. But... Um, It was a shoot for Reality Kings um, in Florida, and it was with Seth Gamble. Oh, he's He's a great person to do your first scene with. I I keep thinking back, and I'm just like, maybe... I shot him, you with him for my Wicked movie. I remember that, yeah. He's like my porn husband. I've worked (laughs) with him more than anyone else. Really? Yeah, like eight times now. But I I think back, and I'm like, maybe if it was like an ugly guy or a guy with like you know, no game or can't perform, then I would have had a different opinion of porn walking Mm -hmm. away. But everything was just perfect. Like, Seth was hot. Everyone was pretty nice. It was an easy, simple scene. And I just, besides, like, staring into the camera, Mm -hmm. I just felt really in my (laughs) element. Yeah. And I wasn't nervous. Like, I couldn't believe I wasn't nervous. And from there, it just felt like, yeah, I want to keep going. Like, I want to work with more guys, more crews, more companies like it was just so fun to me from the first scene yeah that's the atmosphere of your like first initial scenes is so incredibly important because you can you know i mean obviously your first porn scene is going to be something that you're probably never going to forget never and so that experience the experience that you have is so important and it just makes me so sad when I think of like so many girls who just happened to work with the wrong producer yeah. or, or had some horrible experience and then just walked away and was like, this yeah. is, and, and that scene decided their opinion of porn forever yeah. when if it had been somebody else or yeah. some other scene, they might have had a completely different trajectory. And that's how I realized like, I really am so lucky because um, before I was with Spiegler, I was with uh, East Coast Talent. Mm-hmm. And my agent was John O'Byrne, and mm-hmm. he he was a great agent. Um, he got me a lot of work right off the bat for good companies, mm-hmm. not not shitty little companies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even in Florida, good companies. And I just never really, like, I'm not going to lie and say that I've never had a bad scene or yeah. a bad experience on set. But I never had an experience that made me be like, this is not the job for me. Mm -hmm. I never felt like that experience was the norm. Mm -hmm. So I was never scared. I was always like, I knew that something wasn't right. Right, right. So I'm grateful for that, that I had like that standard to go by. And I still use that standard for forever. Yeah. I mean, I see how I'm treated on sets now as a Spiegler girl and, and that I've built my reputation up a little. And I just know that there's a certain etiquette for people on a set and mm-hmm. when the people don't follow it i'm like oh okay mm-hmm. i'll keep that in mind yeah yeah you know it's it's not the norm and yeah. you're not being treated the right way yeah. and it's it's yeah totally okay we're gonna take a quick break mm-hmm. and um then we'll be right back cool. are you a fan of my podcast holly randall unfiltered of course you are well i need your help to keep this show going 
This is why I've set up a Patreon account where you can donate to support my show. And in exchange, you can be eligible for all kinds of cool, fun perks and prizes, which include autographed DVDs and books. See, guys, she's actually signing shit. Free membership passwords to my website, hollyrandall.com. Free mugs, pens, shirts, bags, all kinds of really cool stuff. So take care of me and I will take care of you. I will not only be able to continue to produce this podcast with really awesome, inspiring content about your favorite adult stars, but I will also give back to you in terms of all the cool, fun perks and prizes that we offer. So please, please support me at patreon.com slash Unfiltered. And thank you guys so much for your support. I could not do this without you. All right, everybody, we're back. So... Jane, I want to ask you about one thing that I I saw on Twitter that you had started, which I thought was such a great thing. You know, we've been we've been plagued by a lot of issues of like mental health and depression and yeah. even like suicide with um performers in our industry. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people have really woken up about that recently. Mm-hmm. And mental health is something that doesn't have as much stigma surrounding it as it used to. Like people are really starting to open up and talk about yeah. their struggles with it because I feel like everybody has struggles with mental health now. It's yeah. not like just the crazies. No, and it would be it would be stupid for mental health to be taboo at this point mm-hmm. because I feel like especially in this industry – a lot of people were, we suffer in silence because Mm -hmm. I think this industry attract, I don't want to say it attracts like mentally unstable people, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely a good industry for people who would not work well in like a regular work environment. Like me, for example, That's true. I just knew that school and then like a nine to five job was never going to work out for me. Like I'm too restless. I'm too anxious. Mm -hmm. I, don't have the attention span. Right. And, you know, I, I do suffer, um, from a couple disorders mentally, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it doesn't affect porn for me. If anything, porn makes it easier to manage those things Mm -hmm. because it gives me time to myself, not constantly focusing on work. And, you know, when you do something that you genuinely enjoy, it just brings happiness to your life. That's beyond like, you know, having hobbies. It's Mm -hmm. like when you really enjoy your job, the thing that makes you money, it's like a different kind of happiness. And it gives you like freedom and independence. And I'm really glad that you say that because, you know, so many people equate any kind of mental health problem with the fact that you're in the porn industry. Like, oh, you have anxiety? It must be because you're in porn. Oh, you're (laughs) depressed? It must be because you're in porn. You know, like all of these things, ignoring the fact that accountants have anxiety and depression and, you know, it's pervasive in every single industry. So you started a um, private kind of message test group with other girls in the industry. Is that right? Yeah. So I had been in the month of April, I was going through a really bad, um, period of depression. Mm -hmm. I I don't want to say really bad, but it was worse than I had in a while. Mm -hmm. I just felt really like unmotivated and hopeless and down when I wasn't working. I was just like in bed. Um, and at the time, like none of my friends were really like, available like I know that sounds fucked up on their part but like we all go through things internally and like I don't expect everyone to like be there all the time but Mm -hmm. I felt like a little lost because I just felt like I couldn't really turn to anyone and trust anyone and open up about my issues yeah um so I in the moment, I just said, like, what if we had, like, a group DM with a bunch of girls from the industry who all suffer from, like, either different or the same issues mental health-wise, and we can all just, like, talk to each other about it and vent and give each other advice and then hype each other up, mm-hmm. and I didn't expect it to pop off so much mm-hmm. um, to the point where the group got filled and then we did another one. Um And yeah, I mean, I'm happy that it could help anybody. Like, I'm humbled that, you know, people, like, thought that I was, like, some great person for doing that. But it was really for, like, selfish purposes, to be honest. Like, I wanted a place where I could feel comfortable opening up. But that led me to think that maybe other people would also benefit from that. And that's why I, you know, made the tweet. 
And I think also helping other people um, helps you with your own issues as well because then you feel a sense of purpose and you feel useful. Like I'm in, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic and I am in the 12 step program. And the last step is about helping other alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And like a big part of staying sober is is, having your purpose, is having a purpose and helping other people to achieve sobriety because not only does it make you feel better. Um, about, you know, help about yourself, helping other people, yeah. but it also keeps you in the program yeah. and it keeps you like involved and involved. it keeps you from distancing yourself from other people. Because I think one of the biggest issues that we have these days, and I've said this so many times, but it's what, you know, with social media and, um, the internet and everything is how like distant we've grown from isolated. each other as people. We've become so isolated. And so, you know, anxiety is like skyrocketing, like issues of depression and mental health has gotten so much worse. Yeah, definitely social media has made depression and anxiety worse. Like, for me, I would say um, if I see someone tweet something and, like, let's say they're my friend and I think that, like, maybe the tweet could be about me, Mm -hmm. like, that's going to bother me all day when Mm -hmm. really, like, I should just call the person or text them and be like, hey, like, what's up and talk to them. Mm -hmm. But instead... A tweet. It's all this passive aggressive. Exactly. It's passive aggressiveness and people just not being like real in their true selves and hiding behind a. And then also, too, like sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes somebody's not tweeting about you or subtweeting about you. The way my anxiety works. But your brain automatically goes like, oh, that's about me. I do the same thing. I'm like, oh, they're talking about me. They must be because everything's about me. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And it's it's narcissism. Social media has definitely triggered narcissism that I didn't even know existed in me yeah. and other people too. I mean, I'm more confident, but I'm also more narcissistic. So I'm not afraid to admit like there's goods and bads, but definitely I would say we need to be careful about like letting it take over our lives and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And also like depending on the validation of a bunch of strangers. Yeah, that's so bad. As or well. <laughs> the opposite, letting a bunch of strangers tell us how we should feel about ourselves and yeah. who we are as people. People have never met us. Yeah, never. And I try to like, I try so hard when I see a negative comment. I really just picture like an ugly loser in their basement in the dark like Mm -hmm. eating hot cheetos just like surfing the web watching porn and like commenting on girls bodies like i picture that because i don't really see how somebody who is like happy with their lives and secure with themselves can go around like doing stuff like that yeah trolls are generally people who have too much time on their hands and have you know a lot of like they're very unsatisfied with their own lives. Yeah. That's the thing is like the way people treat you has, is so much more telling about how people are as themselves Absolutely. than it has anything to do with you. I've so had to like come to that conclusion and burn that into my brain Yeah, because like, otherwise you're going to be so unhappy with yeah. all the comments that, I mean, luckily I don't see many negative comments. I think I just have a lot of accounts like muted and blocked, Mm -hmm. but you know, like when I see negativity, I like to go, if it's on Twitter, I like to go on their page and look at all their tweets. Oh yeah. And and it's it's usually, it's all negative and all just hating on girls. And I'm just like, what is your life like? Like genuinely, like when you turn off your phone or close your computer screen, like what do you do? Yeah. What is going on up there that is causing you to lash out at people who are just trying to live their life. And actually you reminded me of something when, um, when you said that you're in Alcoholics Anonymous, Mm. um, that my mom, she's in Overeaters Anonymous. So Mm -hmm. she, it's an eating disorder. And she sent me this quote one time because during April when I was struggling, I told her, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm really struggling mentally. And she sent me this quote. Um, it says, Truer words were never spoken. Lack of acceptance has been the cause of all our problems, according to the Alcoholics Anonymous big book. All my relationships changed the day I started accepting people exactly as they are. Occasionally I forget and revert to my old ways, critical, judgmental. But when I remember to control my instinctive reactions and feel compassion and acceptance for the person rather than ridicule and rejection, I feel better. And then the end of that quote is like, it was, it just spoke to me. It was like, just be compassionate because we are all trying to get by in an often unforgiving world and poorly equipped to do so. 
Yeah. It's and that's just, it's true. so true. Like I'm poorly equipped and it's an unforgiving <laughs> world. And I feel like we're all just like floating here, like trying to, you know, make the most of it, but yeah. there's no need for like unnecessary negativity. Yeah. That's just it's so funny feel. that you say that because there's a morning meeting that I actually, um, I'm secretary of and that I run on, on Saturday mornings. And one of our readings is called Acceptance is the Answer. Mm -hmm. And we read it every single Saturday. And even though I've heard it 10,000 times, um, every time I hear it, I'm like, it's true. Like acceptance is the answer to all our problems because like the root of stuff, one of my, one of the guys in the meeting who's like one of my favorite people, he's actually my co-secretary. He always says the root of suffering is the desire for other people to be not as they are. Yeah. And it's true because like people are going to be who they're going to be. You can't change you people. Can't, the only thing you can do is change your reaction to other people. Yeah. It's the only thing in this life that you have control over. Yeah. Once you come to accept that, life's a lot easier. Yeah. And like another thing that I found out um, from doing some soul searching mm. is that we can't control like what happens to us, but we are responsible for what we do right. after that. Like, yes. like my situation, I couldn't you know it wasn't it wasn't my fault per Mm -hmm. se but I am completely and 100 percent responsible for what direction I take my life in next so like if you get in a car accident and you're paralyzed of course it's not your fault but are you responsible for you know getting your life back on track and you know remaining here yes yeah I think that's yeah it's a great way to you know, another way you can put that is it's it's not about living in the past, but it's about um, you know making changes for the future. Yeah, because so many of moment. us live in the past, we yeah. live in our regrets, and we wallow in them, and that's never going to get you anywhere. In never. Life. That's why I'm happy that um, a lot of the stuff that I've gone through has been like um, when I was 18 before I got into porn. So I feel like once I got into porn, that was kind of like a fresh, clean slate for mm-hmm. me, and. I was able to, you know, make my own reality and do exactly what I wanted to do. And I just feel so happy that I've been able to have, like, control over my own career. Like, I never had um, a controlling agent or a controlling boyfriend or anyone trying to tell me in porn specifically, like, don't do this type of scene, don't do that. I've just been totally, like, in my own head independent and... I'm happy. Like, it feels amazing. Mm -hmm. This is, like, what being an adult... This is the good parts of being an adult, I think, is, like, doing what you want and it paying off and just knowing that you got yourself there. Yeah, it's so funny that you kind of... When I was thinking, when you brought up the whole, like, you know, feeling lucky about having a job that you love and being independent and that kind of stuff, I was thinking... um, So on my way up here today, I was in the studio in this in the studio, sorry, in the elevator in this building. And I got in the elevator with this, with this older man who was dressed in a suit and looked like he was coming back from lunch. And he just looked so downtrodden (laughs) and he was getting off on a floor below me. And when the doors opened, he just heaved this big sigh (sighs) and then just, yeah, exactly. And just walked out back to work. And I just thought for a second, I go, you know what? Like as much as like I love to complain about my job and believe me, there are mornings that I wake up and I'm like, I do not want to go fucking fucking shoot today. Like I do not want to drive to set and work for 12 hours and deal with this and that. But like how lucky am I to have this job that I have and have the independence and the ability to be creative and the ability to work with super cool people like you. Thank you. And to be passionate about the work you do. Yeah. I mean, and I think everybody has days where they wake up and they don't want to go to work. But I just thought to myself, what if like I lost my job right now and I lost my career and I ended up doing some horrible nine to soul crushing nine to five. Like I would look back on my life right now and I would be like, fuck, I had everything that I wanted and I wish I had appreciated it more. Yeah. That's why I just try to keep things in perspective because like it could always be worse, um, just in life in general, but Mm -hmm. definitely in porn, I feel like whatever situation you're in, you know, it can get better. You can have a good experience. Yeah. It can happen. Period. Yay. Well, Jane, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. This was so great. I just feel like 
so happy to be here and I feel like a weight lifted off my shoulders. Good. And I'm glad. And, and I'm glad that you were comfortable talking about that because I think a, a lot of girls do have that kind of uh, yeah. same sex trafficking story. Yeah. And it's, it's really great that you can come on and talk about how you started off in that situation, but then you corrected it. Yeah. And then you moved on to continue in the adult industry yeah. and reach a place where you feel happy and safe and independent. Yes. So people know that like you can have a good experience in this industry. Yes. Now it may not be for you. This job is not for it's everybody, not for everyone. but, um, you know, if you, if you approach it under the right circumstances with the right knowledge under your belt, um, you can have a good experience. And that's also too, why partially why I, I like doing this podcast. Cause I like having people like you on to arm other listeners with yeah. that kind of information and, and to learn more about what their options yeah. are. Well, I'm happy to help. And I just want to say, um, one thing to any like ladies that are in porn that are listening or are newer or think about getting into porn or any type of sex work. No man should control your money or your decisions, period, right. point blank. If they're trying to do that and insisting on it, it's a bad situation. I mean, of course, there's circumstances that I don't know, but I would say 99% of the time, if there's a man that's older than you that is trying to take some of your money for work that you're doing with your body, it's not good. No. And you need to get away from that. And with technology these days and all these different platforms that girls have to make money independently, yeah. like OnlyFans. I like, wish I wish I knew about those yeah. things and like, knew that I like didn't. Like camming too. You yeah. Know, as long as camming you is not itself. bad. My free yeah. cams is not bad. It's just he was using – he, he, he was using that platform he took to the manipulate He you. took the fact that I knew nothing about it and used that as a way to just control the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just important. Please do your research. Please do your research. And the thing is that there's so many <laughs> girls out there like yourself who, you know, and me as well, who are happy to give new girls advice Absolutely. and be completely honest and upfront with I you. I will be so transparent with yeah. anyone. I'm not afraid to share the bad parts of porn because there are, yes. there's bad parts of life. Yes. And to say that they're like, oh, it's just so annoying. Like, I know we're out of time. It's just so annoying how like these anti-porn crusaders, they try to act like the fact that this industry has problems makes it entirely a problem yeah and that's just so false and prejudice yeah i mean look <laughs> i mean look at like the harvey weinstein story has that's everyone hollywood has everyone turned their back on hollywood now no. and they won't watch hollywood movies anymore no because that was one person in an entire industry yeah. and it's the same for us people need to learn how to separate i think the good from the bad and there's yes. definitely a lot of good out there i am a witness to it and you know, this industry is great. That's what I think. Yay. <laughs> All right. We're actually going to ask Jane a couple of extra questions in an exclusive Q&A for my Patreon. Ooh. So if you guys want to catch that bonus content as well as like so much other bonus content that I'm putting up there, um, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Bye.